commercial properties that uh, were vacant. And we made copies of the keys, we put on illegal parties, and we got away with it for quite a lot of time. Uh, subsequently, the law changed, I got arrested, and we moved into slightly, uh, pastures slightly more legal. That, it, it was the kind of the warehouse stroke rave era of the late 80s. Nice. nice. Uh, can you remember your first time behind the decks? What tunes you were playing? Um, my first my first gig was uh, when I was in sixth form at school promoting events for um, as you probably know like when you're when you're in your sort of teens your circle of friends is massive when you're in your twenties your circle of friends kind of contracts a bit by the time you reach my age this is about the only friend I've got so um, when you're um, but when you're young it's really important I think to building up your career as a DJ to exploit that circle of friends you've got. Um, I put on parties in somewhere called the Boston Arms, which was a which is a very big Irish pub in an area called Tuffle Park in North London that uh, turned a blind eye to the fact that our clientele were probably between 15 and 17, and this was a you know a pub function room always, always the way. And um, but I think on, 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 a, on a broader level, it's really important. Um, a, lot, a lot of up-and-coming DJs and a, a lot of independent promoters use a system where they'll book DJs on the basis of the fact that they will, they will generate a paying guest list and generate uh, sort of mates attendance. And you know, you can be the greatest DJ in the world. You can make good tunes, but if, you know, you've really got to tap into your mates um, while you've still got them, unlike me. Oh, come on. All you lot of friends of his, right? Yeah. DJs are all friends, huh? I'll tell you what, where did the name Touch Calls Jules come from? Um, I, well, I don't know. I mean, inevitably, lots of DJs in the room, and, and some of you will have stage, stage names, and some of you, more sensibly, will use your own names. But um, I basically did a degree in law, and um, part of this whole illegal party scenario was that when the police came to the door, um, well, the door is not a good way of describing it, more like the gates to the warehouses. It was always me that had to give it the big black saying, hello officer, this is a, an event for me and my law student chums, uh, sounding as posh as I could. And um, the, the, the name judge kind of stuck from there because um, obviously I wasn't a judge, I don't wear a wig and I'm not a Freemason, but um, I had a law degree. So the gift of the gab translated into a radio presenter, how did that come out? The, uh, I started, um, radio-wise, I started on uh, a pirate station that didn't last very long. Um, I don't know if anybody in here has been involved with pirate. There's a lot, especially when you're young, it's it's quite sort of risque, particularly in London, because pirate stations generally broadcast from quite dodgy estates, and you're, you're basically encouraged to turn up not looking like a DJ, <coughs> which in my case, wearing even more geeky glasses as I did back then, wasn't very difficult. I just didn't look like a DJ. So you were told not to bring CDs, not bring, not bring a CD case, don't bring a record bag. Uh, just turn up, and I, I got involved with Pirate Radio, which was quite amazing at the time. I still, personally, I, I, depending on where you come from, I'm sure you guys come from locations with Pirate, and I think Pirate is still really, really important, particularly in London. Uh, covers a lot of genres that only get sort of skeletal coverage on, on mainstream radio. And that's how I started and then joined another station which was Kiss FM, the pirate station. It became the first uh, became the first pirate station to be given legitimate status in, in a generation, literally in 25 years. And that was in the early 90s. I started off doing the Friday and Saturday shows there and actually it became a real recruiting ground for Radio 1, both at backroom level and um, and front of house. There's a, a really big list of DJs, some of whom are still on Radio 1, who came from KISS, Trevor Nelson being another example, Westwood being another, um, and went to Radio 1 um, 12 years ago, and touch wood, there, there you find me. Lovely stuff, but of course you were going to originally pursue a career as, as uh, in law, correct? Uh, I was never actually a lawyer, I've got a degree in law. Yeah, you've got a degree in law. How did your parents feel about you just taking a DJ? Um, well, I guess if you've got a, you know, DJing is, I think it's really important to remember that, you know, I'm lucky enough to make a full-time uh, career, full-time income out of DJing. But, yeah. you know, for the majority of people, I know that, you know, DJing is a sort of part-time occupation. And, you know, for that, I consider myself very lucky. My, my dad was an actor. Um, and in a sort of similar scenario, knew all about doing what he loved, but not actually necessarily being able to make a full-time income out of it, and was therefore very supportive. So it's a case you've really got a 
appreciate if you believe in that's what you want to do. You've got to really work really hard for it. Obviously, you've got to work hard. There's, I mean, there's, there's loads of facets to what you've got to do, and, and only only the most you know brazen-headed person who's been successful in any sphere would would deny the influence of luck. You need your lucky breaks as well. Obviously, when you when you think of jazz shows, you think you think trance music. What were the sort of influences to make you go down, go down that route originally? Um, well, I, the two big musical eras that were, were very hugely significant for me was, was the kind of the, the acid house rave era. I was very instrumental in a lot of the big acid house raves that happened in the late eighties and early nineties when I was really really young. Um, it was just it was just a special moment when, when you can kind of feel a new type of music coming through, uh, and you think you know you and your mates are into it a part of a small clique and, and everybody else doesn't understand it there's nothing more powerful than that and i think that the same applied to trance and there's, there's a few other areas of music i've got some friends who you know big time in, in the drummer bass and in the dubstep thing and you know they, they they've got that same feeling it's really nice to, to just know that you know something that you you've got and you believe in and is, you, is your life um is never going to be understood by the mainstream population Stuff. So um, let's, let's think about you, the biggest track for you of all time, the biggest trance track of all time for you. Um, Big question. I, I suppose I suppose my my favourite tune of all time would be uh, a thing called Moments in Love by Art of Noise, which is like a chill out record, but it's just a, a thing that has, would influence so many different areas of music. And I suppose the generic answer to a favourite track always has to be, because I think the video is so amazing, uh, Massive Attack, Unfinished Sympathy, because sure. I just, just think it's one of the greatest videos of all time. Amazing stuff. Uh, biggest track of now, let's think 2011. Oh, that's, that's a really that's tough a, one. A one. Is that's it. I think you'd have to throw that out onto the floor, to be honest. To do that, mate. <laughs> there you go, you get that. Take that. Now, I think we all know you're not a stranger to cheesy catchphrases. Uh, you know, <laughs> what are you saying? Occasionally, what are you saying? with thinking, putting sort of Tony Blackburn, Pat Sharp in the shade. Give us oh. your top three cheesy catchphrases. Well, I, I sort of make them up on the fly, so I can't really remember. I can tell you something I said on Radio One last night, which is just appalling. Uh, we're on the case, like Samsonite. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Uh, why have I been sacked already? <laughs> now, of course, you, a DJing career that spanned 20, 25 years, right? Technology has changed hugely over the, over the time. Do you try and keep up with that, or is that kind of, you know, you stick into the original? You know, I'm not talking, no, you have to be absolutely up there with technology, but there's, there's, there's different schools of thought in terms of DJing, and I'm sure this is probably the most important question for a lot of people here, you know, which route you take, and I mean, I travel, I do sort of 200 odd gigs a year. My only my only regular residencies is my summer, my summer residency in Ibiza, which is 16 weeks, and I do the ministry in London a lot, but apart from that, I spend, my, my, I divide my time sort of 50% between doing UK gigs and 50% doing stuff in other parts of the world. And the one thing I've noticed is that, is that, that the travelling DJs, almost all, but there's a, the, with a couple of exceptions, tend to go down the memory stick or, uh, or CD route, because, it, because they're kind of plugging up thing, or sort of getting into the back of the mixer and trying to plug up a laptop scenario, is very difficult if you're turning up and going, whereas the majority of resident DJs that I encounter tend to use laptops, so I'm sort of in favour of whatever works for an individual. I mean, the only comment that I would have is I think if you are a laptop DJ, you need to be very careful about not making it look like you're answering your emails or doing your MySpace, but yeah. Yeah. Facebook, but that's, that's a fairly obvious generic comment. So, I mean, I'm DJing off CD still. Do you think I should? I really need to move on. A bit behind the times. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> CDs. I mean, I do. I make lots and lots of my own tracks and my own versions of things. I mean, in any DJ set I do will be at least fifty percent my own bootleg, stroke remixes, stroke productions, sure. and um, so I tend to do my kind of creative, creative stuff at home and, and kind of let the music do the talking when I'm DJing. Whereas there are other people who like using. Um, you know, the MIDI setups and doing a lot more creatively on the fly in the live environment. Um, so, so it's what's good for you, but I definitely think that, you know, having having caused myself back injuries, shoulder injuries from the era of vinyl when it was just so heavy lumping everything around, especially if you were travelling and you, you wanted to go hand luggage and you didn't want the stupid um, baggage handlers to go stealing your records, so you're always trying to sort of hide this bag of vinyl and I've, I've now got a sort of um, a trapped nerve in one shoulder, I've got kind of sciatica from the from the stooping uh, thing of DJing. Um, 
and, uh, and now you've got the option of, you know, then we went to kind of CD wallets, which you could wave around like Naomi Campbell.